Looking to fast forward your practice goals? Commonwealth Financial Network can help you evolve your business by providing entrepreneurial capital, affiliation flexibility, and tailored business strategies. Everything you need to put your practice into the fast lane. Welcome to a better path to success. Welcome to Commonwealth. To learn more, visit Commonwealth.com. Commonwealth Financial Network is a member of FINRA, SIPC, a registered investment advisor. Hi, I'm Suzanne Syracuse. Welcome to my podcast focused on the future, keys to building a profitable, sustainable, and impactful business. And I'm excited to be partnering with wealthmanagement.com on this. This series will focus on what firms need to embrace to ensure their growth and success for the future. And you'll hear from industry leaders and advisors on what is working for them. I have a great lineup of guests in store. And today I'm talking with Jimmy Lee. Jimmy is the founder and CEO of Wealth Consulting Group, a wealth management firm with over 44 offices, 250 team members and advisors, and over $7 billion in assets under advisement, and whose self-described mission is to serve as their client's personal CFO and most valued advisor. I love that. Welcome, Jimmy. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so looking forward to speaking with you. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for having me on and and great to see you again. Yeah, you too. You too. So I want to start at the beginning. You founded your firm in 1995, almost 30 years ago. So tell us about your personal journey into wealth management and how does that impact how you lead your team and run your business today? Well, so I, I did get into business in 1995. That was the year after I got out of college. So this career, being a financial advisor, um, was my really first professional experience in a career at all. And so I would say that one of the unique things for me was that I started out as a self-employed financial advisor. Now, I was attached to a large firm, meaning that I was sitting in a branch setting in a nice corporate office in Las Vegas and and affiliated with the broker-dealer and the company that, you know, like a Fortune 100 uh, broker dealer that was owned by an insurance company. And so I thought I was an employee financial advisor. We had, you know, a bunch of people in there. We had trainees that I was a part of uh, that training class. There was a sales manager, a person that owned the local branch. It was a franchise type of a situation. And so I thought I was an employee, but I wasn't. And at the end of the year, I was surprised that my uh, accountant said that I owed a bunch of taxes because they did take out a little bit of money uh, for for Social Security taxes and stuff like that out of part of my income. But I didn't even really know that I was self-employed. So I would say that being an entrepreneur from literally day one and never really, even though I had managers and things like that, never, you know, working for someone else has really carried on. And so I've been a risk taker and probably, you know, more of a risk taker earlier on in my career than I am today, but I've been a risk taker my entire career as an entrepreneur. And I started out as a solo financial advisor, but then a few years in, and and this is in my like mid twenties, I get an opportunity to become the person in the office that they called an investment specialist, which meant that I had to go get a series 24 to be a registered principal. Uh, and other licenses I didn't have to be able to supervise other, other individuals in the branch. So here I am in my mid twenties, literally supervising. We had an individual in the office that was registered and over 80 years old. And so there's, you know, 50 some odd people in the branch with securities licenses. And my job was to help promote the sales of securities products, but also supervise and do compliance. And at that time in this setting, I had both jobs. And obviously that's a huge conflict of interest now being paid overrides for selling. And also, you know, signing off on applications and so forth. But that's how I started. So that got me into management too. And and that's, you know, come a long way in in October of 2014, decided to set up an RIA and attach myself to uh, LPL Financial, who's the broker dealer that I'm affiliated with as well. And we actually have about 150 plus advisors that are attached to the RIA. And I think we touch about 280 people total. That's including our own team members, as well as um, staff of the advisors that we serve. And we have 40, over 40 branches scattered throughout the country and about seven to seven and a half billion dollars in total assets, including brokerage. 
of which you're correct. Over five is in the RIA side. Wow. Um, so, the, you know, what's really interesting is that you started out immediately kind of knowing that you wanted to be a financial advisor, a financial professional. How did how did you even learn about it, that you wanted to become that? Well, that's an interesting story, too. I think early on, my mom used to tell me that I was always interested in money. And whenever I got money from birthdays or holidays or whatever, I just save it. And so I guess when I was a child, I would I would save all my money. And my brother would always come to me. My older brother would always come to me to borrow money from me. So I think I always liked money back growing up. And then my mom also, also said that I was very careful with my money and very analytical in a sense that I, she would walk me into a clothing or a shoe store and I would analyze all the different things in there for like an hour and then say, yeah, nothing's good enough. And I'd walk out with nothing. So I was very careful, I guess, with also spending it. So I don't know if it was rooted in me as a child, but I think as I you know, got older, high school, uh, and then in college, you know, I, I got a degree in, in finance <clears throat> and I was actually able to meet people that were in the business and some people that were very, very successful. So in college, I worked at a golf course at a private country club. And one of the members was a very, very successful financial advisor in town. And actually, you know, uh, we were, became friends and he liked me and I asked him for a job and I was going to go work at a wirehouse, which is where he was at. But that firm was not going to hire any trainees until March of the following year. And I wanted to, I wanted to get to work. And so what happened was, is that when I was interning for credits to finish up college, I was interning for another broker at the same firm that this gentleman was at. And on the second floor of our building was a friend of mine who had, who had graduated finance with me and was working at the firm that I started with. And they came downstairs, he and the sales manager and said, Hey, look, you can go work with that guy if you want in March. Why don't you get all your licenses with us and get started? And if you want to change later on, you can change. And that's what happened. And, and I had a very good first actual production month after months and months of training and getting licenses. I got the biggest check I've ever seen in my life. And, and what does a young person do then? I quickly bought a convertible like two months later. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so much for being yeah. careful with your money, right? There you go. I guess that all changed over 20 plus years. So but uh, that's that's uh, how I got started and I stayed. And uh, that's how I started my career. I, I love that. You know, you're you're a, I, I've spoken to a couple of people over my career about having a similar story where they were working at a golf club and there was a very successful financial advisor that was a member and they started talking. And that is what the catalyst was to uh, get them into uh, the wealth management industry. So there's something to be said for going and working at a golf club. And then I think you also, you know, reference the importance of internships and having an internship and and getting the experience that you need to see if it's even something that you are interested in. So I love that story. I'm always fascinated with how people get into this industry because we still don't do a great job of of explaining what a financial advisor does and and is and especially in the colleges and universities. So that's great, but it, you definitely had that entrepreneurial entrepreneurial blood from a from a long um, from a long time ago, it seems, and continued that on. I do have something to add to that story. So when I was interning at that same firm, it was kind of a large regional wirehouse firm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was only doing it for credit. So they weren't even paying me. So I was getting three credits to, to finish up college. And I worked for this other broker, but I met the most interesting characters. So, you know, growing up, I loved that movie Wall Street, you know, with Charlie Sheen <laughs> and Daryl Hannah. And uh, anyway, Michael Douglas. Uh, Michael Douglas, right. So I love that movie. And the, the back in the 90s and the mid 90s, it was still like that. So in this in this regional wirehouse, there were different characters. And there was this one guy I met, his name is Charlie Kim, I remember saying, he was like trading options. And he eventually ended up getting out of the career, because he blew up his whole book of business trading options and was doing risky stuff. And, and I had to write a paper to get my credits. And I remember writing that I did not want to work at a Wall Street wirehouse because all the all the doors were closed. People were concerned about stealing clients from each other. And there were some people in there that were, you know, doing like crazy, crazy, like aggressive investment strategies and stuff like that. And so the person that actually 
was thinking I was going to go work with was actually doing managed money and had a, you know, like over a billion dollars of asset center management back then, which was a lot in managed money. And that really attracted me because I've always wanted to be more of a relationship person than sitting behind a desk trying to trade stocks for a living. So anyway, there was an interesting story about how I kind of, even back then, wanted to be more on the independent side versus working for a big Wall Street firm. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the movie Wall Street and there's also, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street and Boiler Room and, you know, any of the movies that have been out there, the big short that that reference our profession, they're not very positive, (laughs) to be honest. Um, And so it's it's interesting that they influenced the type of firm that you didn't want to be a part of. And, you know, again, I, I am a big fan of, of what financial advisors do for individuals. And so I think anything that we all can do as an industry to, to try and change the perception of, of what the financial advice industry is, it's really about helping people. Um, it, it would be important, but I, I love those uh, kind of beginnings to how people, successful people like yourself, started out in, um, into the profession. And obviously you've been very successful. Um, you've grown your firm, as you mentioned, all those numbers, um, you've been in the business for a long time. So there's a lot of things that have changed. So what are some key areas that you feel are critical to a firm achieving success now as our industry and the people it serves evolves? You know, I think it's really important to always pay attention to where where things are headed. So that great quote by the, the amazing hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, about, you know, looking at where the puck is going, right? And the industry has changed a lot. Just in the last few years, it's changed a lot. So we've seen massive consolidation recently with a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions, especially with large firms. And I don't think that's going to change now. That being said, I still think there is a, an absolute place for a solo practitioner that has a niche or, you know, lives in a neighborhood or a community that, you know, the person is well respected and can get referrals and, and have a very successful business and, and provide intimate, you know, concierge type services for their clients. And, and so there's a lot of those advisors out there today. I don't think that's ever going to go away. Although I've heard, you know, on other podcasts and other people in our industry say that if you're not going to be with a large firm that has the resources to provide the the tools to compete, you're going to be out of business. I don't believe that. Okay. That being said, I think it's really important to to stay on top of what's going to be happening going forward. In fact, I was just talking to a gentleman that I'd met, a new friend of mine. I've met him several times at different RIA type meetings, and and he's an owner majority owner of a large firm too, a a $2 billion plus RIA type firm. And he was just talking about how this year they've had three clients, significant clients pass away with large assets that left the shop, you know, that left their firm, just the nature of the business that obviously they didn't, they didn't uh, have their, uh, their children probably as clients and that money left. And so even for advisors that have mature books of business and older clients, I mean, there's a lot of uh, M&A transactions going on right now with with succession planning and advisors that are retiring and people buying those practices. And if you're buying clients that are much, much older and, you know, you have to be very cons- careful and, and thoughtful about the type of business that you're acquiring, because if, if naturally those clients are all going to pass away in the next 10, 20 years, you might have to really, you know, reorganize your strategy to make sure that you get those get those children or those clients like right away so that you don't end up losing them. So I think paying attention to where the industry is headed. And again, I still see a lot of M&A and a lot of consolidation happening. And I think so you have to make sure that you're staying, staying uh, in touch with that and also competitive with what's going on with your competition, with the best financial advisors in your city. Absolutely. I love what you just said about making sure you're paying attention to the kids. And I know there's been a lot of discussion around, you know, if you're mostly dealing with the with the male husband in the in the um, household, make sure that you're talking with both partners. 
But the uh, t- paying attention to the kids from that, you know, generational wealth transfer, I think is another really, really critical thing that firms need to be doing and having a strategy around that. And, you mm-hmm. know, things like estate planning can really help bridge that gap. If you start incorporating that as one of your offerings, it makes it maybe a little bit easier to to then bring up the conversation of the kids, you know? Yeah, and I think there's there's different ways of communi- preferred communication. So a lot of baby boomers and older clients love the old-fashioned face-to-face meetings. Um, and that's changing too. Even those clients are being more accustomed to doing Zooms and teleconferences versus actually face-to-face as long as they know who the advisor is and they trust the advisor, right? But their children, if they're millennials or younger, they may not never want to even see you ever. So all their, you know, all their communication they do is online or through texting or through compliance methods that are compliance approved methods of texting and things like that. So, you know, and there's not, a, I think the technology that we have to deal with in our industry is also an obstacle, right? So, you know, just, just until recently, a lot of the independent firms didn't have you know, compliance approved technology for things like texting, which is what a lot of people do um, and things like that. So getting on the forefront of that and and adopting technology that, you know, is going to continue to take, you know, uh, dominant or, or have dominance in, in the way that people do business going forward is really important, I think. And then we have to pay attention to AI. I was just with a friend of mine that owns an AI learning company, and I sent him over a video a two minute video of myself um, with hand gestures. And, and he says that he can now create any content for me using my own face and my gestures that looks like it's me of any topic I want to talk about like this through AI. And so, so wait a minute about how, yeah. are you kidding me? Like, so you're saying that you don't even have to be the one doing it. He can take your features and the way that, and your voice and basically somebody and just program it. To, so you don't even have to be the one saying it all? A thousand percent. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's pretty phenomenal. So, you know, I think a lot of advisors are concerned about going out of business because of AI. I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, I was just at a, a meeting where I was able to listen to Jamie Dimon talk at a JP Morgan meeting, and it was phenomenal. And he, and I love listening to him talk. And he was saying how he, he believes you know, people will always want financial advice, especially people that have more money. And so I don't think our our profession will ever go away because of computers. But, you know, what AI can possibly do for advisors and their businesses to be more proactive on service or to be able to know what the clients are concerned about, you know, without having actual conversations with them, that's powerful. You know, even sitting in a sitting in a meeting or a conference and not having to take notes because it's very difficult to listen while you're listening. You know, having technology able to do that, and so there's a like a lot of different ways that I think our profession will evolve and become more efficient. I hope because of technology like AI. And so I think paying attention to again where that puck's going, the most competitive advisors I think are the ones that fully utilize technology sooner than later. And to make their businesses more efficient so they can lower their costs and and actually provide a better level of service. I I couldn't agree more. And, you know, AI, I mean, it it certainly continues to evolve. I mean, just the note taking capability on Zoom. So like to your point, like imagine if you have if you're an advisor and you're, as you said, you probably don't capture everything if you just have something like that, that's able to do that for you, the amount of time that it's going to save you so that it allows you to be more client facing. So I love everything that you just said. Those are really, really great areas to focus on as our, as our industry uh, continues to evolve. And then on the same note, as investor demographics are changing in our country, what are you doing at your firm and what do you what advice do you have for other advisors on how to capture you know the next generation of investors interest in loyalty as clients what are some of those things that are maybe a little bit different with that group than maybe the current or the baby boomer investor group you know i think as as we've always been trained in our industry to 
try to find out what's most important to our clients about their money and their financial goals. I think it's even if it's even become even more important nowadays because people's, you know, desires for their money and how they invest their money, I think are changing with demographics. And so in our firm, and this is a very hot topic today, we created ESG screened portfolios over six years ago. And we knew that there was a large segment of investors that would be very interested in aligning hopefully their values with the way they invest. And you know what's really the controversy or controversial part of ESG has been recently over the last couple of years, it's been politicized. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's it's really taken, I think, a, a route or direction, it's gone a direction in some ways that's not so great in, in both directions, I think. And so what we've done is make sure that we have tools for our advisors like ESG screen portfolios to make sure that if their clients are interested in that, that they're not hearing about a solution from other some, somebody else. Mm-hmm. So even for our advisors that, you know, have, let's say one out of 15 clients of theirs might be interested in it. We still think it's very important for them to ask every single client of theirs or prospect if that's something that matters to them and to make sure that those prospects or clients are aware that we have tools or they have tools to be able to help them meet their client where their client wants to invest. Okay. We've also more recently in the last 12 months created a portfolio that's geared towards um, women investors that are interested in investing in portfolios that are screened uh, for companies that are doing things that are more empowering for women. And so uh, there are tools now out there and companies that are doing research that are screening for these types of things for like from a, from a gender lens perspective. And so we created that portfolio for advisors. And I, I think we've done a poor job, honestly, of marketing both of those and but I think there's a big, big market for the gender lens uh, type investing strategies out there. And I just read an article this morning from another large RIA firm that just came out with another portfolio today, or not today, but recently around investing in companies uh, in SP 500 with women CEOs. And so there, it seems like there was an interest beyond just uh, what, what I know about. And you know, I know that for certain advisors that are understand niche marketing and understand how to target and uh, do very well with, you know, working in certain segments like that. Uh, these are the kind of tools that advisors can potentially use to be more attractive to the kind of clients that they want to attract and be more targeted. So we're doing things like that. And, uh, you know, we've always been a firm that really has always believed in having a consultative relationship with their client, whether it's a formal financial planning relationship or not, but we don't want to be transactional. We don't want to attract advisors that want to be transactional. So we're unique in the sense, Suzanne, that we we give away our planning services virtually for free almost to the majority of our clients through our advisors. We think we don't know of any other firms that are really doing that, but we do that. And we think it's really important because we think that helping clients achieve their financial goals and help them getting crystal clear about what's important to them about their money and then feeling secure about that and having a good plan in place, especially when things are uncertain like like right now, even though the market's up and we're having a pretty darn good year, most people don't feel very good about the, about their, their accounts right now. And so I think it's very important during times like now that advisors can, you know, talk about planning and big picture versus being so focused on what's going on today in the market. Yeah, you know, I think that, um, first of all, that's really smart. And I applaud you guys for, you know, really creating some of those portfolios that are anticipating what not just what investors want now, but certainly the next generation of investors are going to be looking for. I interviewed uh, another advisor, Maurice Miller, a couple episodes ago, and he was saying the same thing, that a lot of his next gen clients are asking specific questions about what types, what's in that mutual fund, what types of company, what kind of products are are uh, they supporting? Is that company supporting or manufacturing? We don't want anything that has to do with guns, say, for example, meaning clients are asking for that. We want or we want to support um, female led firms like you were just alluding to. These are kind of still growth areas, but they are 
by far going to be much more requested and demanded from clients in the future. It's already, you're already seeing kind of the writing on the wall, like this is happening. So I think for you, again, going back to your like skate where the puck is going is um, applicable in this instance as well. You know, I do want to touch on a thing about the term ESG. So, you know, there's been I think debate on whether or not, you know, ESG is going to be, you know, that term is going to be around in the next year. What kind of thoughts do you have about how you, how an advisor positions that? Yes. I know you and I talked about this earlier, but I was just at a conference where there was a, an analyst, an ETF analyst from a very prominent research company, very, very prominent one that said that he believes all ESG portfolios or models and strategies will really be dead in in a year or so. And I really don't believe that, but I know that that a lot of people do believe that. And I think what I read as we discussed was that for the first time there were outflows out of ESG, net outflows out of ESG funds, I think in the last quarter. And that hasn't that hasn't ever happened. And so I, I, like I said, I think the, this whole topic's been very politicized. I know that there's a CEO of a very, very large, large, large company, which I won't say for compliance reasons, but in this analyst said, this person who's been very proactive at talking about ESG hasn't mentioned the term ESG in over a year. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's a, that's a little anecdote that he was suggesting that was, was going on or that the story that he was saying. And you know, I think, again, it's gotten so politicized. And I think what will happen is, is that ESG will become more specific because that is so broad. Yep. <laughs> the, the, you know, the mandate of ESG, it's so broad. And that's where all the critics can come in and really beat it up. And so I think what's going to happen is, is that the research companies that are in this space are going to become more and more specific and uh, be more specialized so that. And, and the regulators want that, too. Because the regulators are very concerned that people are using the the ESG thing to make money or to deceive people to make money, right? So yep. I think there'll be a lot more clarity going forward. And I think that's all that's that's gonna be great because some people do care about the two letters of the three letters or one more than a lot more than the other two or three or others, excuse me. And so I think I think being more targeted can help meet meet clients and investors more where they want to be and how they want to invest. I still believe that there are a lot of people, if they're aware of it, that they can invest their monies with companies that are more in line with who they are as, as people and their values. I really do believe that's a very strong thing, including, I know that there are a lot of advisors that are Christian-based advisors that have created portfolios and are strategies out there for Christian-based kind of thematic investing. I think that's awesome too. And that really resonates with people that have the same type of uh, belief and faith, right? And so exactly. I think I think I think you're going to continue to see more of that and it'll be a little bit less general than what we've seen in the past which I think is great for the industry and great for the investor. Yeah, and going back to to a discussion that I had a few episodes ago as people are becoming more comfortable sharing their views with their trust advisor and in general on social media, nobody seems to be shy anymore, that it that it opens a door for that conversation that maybe wouldn't have taken place five years ago. So I do think that that, whether it's going to be called ESG or something else, um, it's more about the concept. And I think you're right, like to really get more honed in on what that actually would be based on um, an individual's values and beliefs and what they want to support. So again, really, really critical. Um, switching gears, uh, I did want to bring up that your firm was a past winner of the Investment News Excellence in Diversity and Inclusion Award. And with this enhanced lens on culture now, what is an example of what your firm is doing to create a culture in which team members can bring their, you know, true selves to work. What are some things that you've done and that you could recommend to other firms to, to consider? You know, I, I just feel so grateful that I was born to the parents that I am born to. We were immigrants in, to the United States from Korea, South Korea, 
when I was six years old. And so as a first generation immigrant myself into what I believe is the greatest country in the world, I just feel so lucky to be able to, to be here and have the opportunities that we have here in the United States. And so I think from that sort of beginning comes, you know, what the Wealth Consulting Group has evolved into. And so we were very fortunate and very grateful to be able to um, recognize for diversity and inclusion when, when Investment News did it, I think for the first time in 2018 or so, I think. You know, it was one of our advisors who's actually, you know, LGBTQ said, hey, you guys should apply for this award. And she's a great advisor. I think you know her. And um, she's always looking out for us. And so we did. And, uh, you know, we were recognized because we were diverse, but it was not by intention at that time at all. So I think, again, we got we got to a position of being very diverse just because, again, from my beginnings and who I am. And it's been funny because we've also another one of one of our strengths is that we have a lot of female advisors in our firm relative to the industry percentage wise. And the female advisors we have are awesome high producing advisors, too. So they're very productive and very successful business people. And so I just think that, you know, the referrals that we get to other female advisors are from them because they're, you know, they're, they're going to conferences and maybe some firms that are not as friendly to female advisors, you know, they, we get a lot of referrals and that's how kind of how we've grown. Right. And so I think we've had that, we've had that foundation from the very beginning and, and it's our advisors that are recommending other people to join us, which is a great story to have, right? I'm very proud to be a part of that story. So I think that's kind of how it started. And then once we were recognized for it, I have to be completely honest with you that we have not been able to successfully capitalize on, I think, tremendous business opportunities. For example, you know, trying to find advisors that fit a specific demographic and really work towards, you know, helping clients that are in the same demographic in certain communities, that kind of a thing. I think there's a huge business case for that. Yep. that's not something that we've been successful at implementing yet, but just because we're so aware of diversity and inclusion that we attract people, both, you know, team members that we never had before that are from different backgrounds or color that, that are part of our group now, ever since, you know, that award was, was given to us. And so it's just, it's just something that we're all aware of. And mm -hmm. I think that we have a lot of diverse people in our firm that have completely different, maybe personal beliefs, but the one common thing is, is that that they're all very nice people and they're just good human beings. And I think that's something that uh, we attract because a lot of our advisors like to communicate and collaborate with each other. In fact, collaborations, uh, the word collaborate is a part of our guiding principles. And, you know, we offer lots of opportunities to collaborate. And when it comes when it comes to female advisors, it's been it's funny because I joke around because about you know, the, the, the pay, the, the, the pay gap within genders, right. Gender pay gap. And I joke because the women that I have around me are not those types of women. So the women around me are the ones that are always asking for raises and always. And so I kind of joke, but again, I think it's because we do have good diversity. I think we could use more. And so I don't think, I don't think we're the best firm to interview or I'm not the best person to interview about how the, we've been successful at that, but we are pretty diverse and we continue to get more diverse. I just, I just believe because we're open and, and we have a lot of good people and it's good to have diversity, right? Because you get different thoughts and different thinking and from people in different backgrounds, it's, it's invaluable for, for a business. I think that's trying to do business with people, you know, in different communities throughout the United States. Well, I think you're being humble first of all. And, but I do think what your point is, is that, you authentically and organically became an inclusive firm because of, and it, and it, I, I always say it always starts at the top. The leader, the leader sets the example and, and the, and I know a lot of the, the, the women that work at your firm, they're very successful. They could go a lot of different places and they stay at your firm and they refer into your firm because of an authentic and inclusive culture that was not by design to your admission, but more just natural. 
And I think that that is probably one of the reasons that you were awarded that award in its in, 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 in inaugural year. I was still there, I believe. And just having one of your advisors be the one that says, we should, we should apply for this is testament in itself. So I think just by not having a strategy, but it organically being something that's just part of your DNA is a great lesson for those that are listening. So congratulations to you on that. I, I, I think that's true. And I think about the one, one thing I would say is more intentional now is just awareness. And so we're just much more aware of it. And I think that type of energy attracts, right? And so it it's a universe at work. And so that's just, it's just what's been going on. I love it. I think, again, now everybody's a little bit more aware for lots of different reasons, which is fantastic. But the fact that you you were ahead of your time um, without it having a planned strategy around it. Um, again, it goes back to authenticity. We talk a lot about that on this podcast. So I can't believe it, but we are we are actually at the um, last question. And I always ask the same question to all my guests. With the title and theme of the podcast focused on the future, keys to building a sustainable, profitable, and impactful business in mind, what is your last line? What key takeaway do you want to leave with our audience today? You know, I would say that there's two parts to this answer. And one is always try to continue to do the right things. And so whenever you're faced with any major decisions, you know, I think there's always a writer decision. Even though if there's two good decisions, there's a better one. And, and understanding your values can help you make those decisions for both personal and professional reasons. And then the other thing is really start to understand or, or better understand, excuse me, what your genius is and what you really love to do and what you're good at. And, and for yourself and for other people that are around you, try to help position them in a, in a, in a way that allows all of us to take advantage of that. So if we can spend the majority of our time in our genius, and, and I'm stealing this from my business coach because he coaches me on this all the time, life gets a lot easier. And so less conflicts, less obstacles, you know, less things you're having to deal with because you are making better decisions and you are spending time doing the things you love. I love that. And yeah, it's kind of like, what's your superpower? And you know, I think as we all get older, it becomes clearer what that is. But I love that you go to a coach too. They, I've had coaches help me uh, quite a bit with gain clarity on on what made me ha- what makes me happy in my career. So, anyway, that's a great uh, last line. I just want to thank you again so much for being my guest today. I think you provided some amazing advice to our listeners on what it takes to be successful by focusing on key initiatives that impact growth and by preparing for and understanding the evolving expectations that investors have for advisors. I'm Suzanne Syracuse. Thanks for listening. And I hope this episode leaves you feeling even more excited to be focused on the future. Looking to fast forward your practice goals? Commonwealth Financial Network can help you evolve your business by providing entrepreneurial capital, affiliation flexibility, and tailored business strategies, everything you need to put your practice into the fast lane. Welcome to a better path to success. Welcome to Commonwealth. To learn more, visit Commonwealth.com. Commonwealth Financial Network is a member of FINRA, SIPC, a registered investment advisor.